Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy. This season is all about intentional comfort, and we'll be taking a look at the crossroads of the inspiration, intention, and action that you can take to bring more comfort and joy to your everyday. This is your host, Paula Jenkins. Welcome to episode 315 here on Jumpstart Your Joy. This week on the show, I'm really excited to welcome Heather Hall, who is a transformative leadership coach and executive coach, and she's also the author of Step Up and Stand Out, 20 Tips for Aspiring Introverted Leaders. I just love this topic so much because if you have been tuning in, you know that during the pandemic, I realized I'm probably a lot more introverted than I even realized before. And there were a lot of aha moments for me in reading Heather's brand new book. So I cannot wait to have her on to talk about that. Before we get to the interview, I want to say thank you so much for tuning in. It's always so much fun to be able to do this show, and I am grateful that you are here and listening. If you are new, or you want to find out more about the show, about the past episodes, you can find everything over at the website, which is jumpstartyourjoy.com. This episode will be on the front page, or you can search for Heather Hall. There's a search feature on the website. You can find it there, and you can also look up all the old past episodes by clicking on podcast. And while you're on the website, you can consider purchasing my book, which is Jumpstart Your Joy, Heart-Centered Ways to Find Joy in the Messy Middle, or you can sign up for my newsletter. And I send out updates usually a couple times a month to share that new episodes have gone up and to stay in touch with some really joyful things. One thing that I want to explain because I think that the terms introverted and extroverted get, they get used a lot in popular culture. And sometimes people associate it with outgoing versus shy. And what I want to clear up is that extroverted and introverted is really about how someone gets their energy. So an extroverted person enjoys or gets energy from being around other people, interacting with people, and being social with others. An introvert, on the other hand, gets their energy from downtime or alone time by themselves. And so that's the differentiator. Society really kind of embraces extroverted traits, traits more so than introverts. And what I realized over the course of the pandemic, for most of my life, I had been playing to the extroverted traits. But what I discovered was when I was playing the role of the extrovert, I oftentimes was very drained. You know, I was energetically drained and I felt Like I really needed to recoup after things like leading retreats or being with a lot of people. That was really draining to me. And so that was the first thing I noticed that then led me to realize, you know, I think I'm a lot more of an introvert. I was really excited when Heather reached out to me to let me know that she was writing a book. And I will say that then reading Heather's book filled in a lot of the pieces about why Working in a corporate environment felt draining as well. So I really appreciate that Heather dives in and explains how introverts can thrive in a corporate setting and how they can, even though it may not be in their comfort zone, step up and stand out. So welcome to the show, Heather Hall. Thank you, Paula. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so delighted to have you on because, of course, you're talking about introverts. Would you like to tell us what were your earliest sparks of joy? What brought you, you know, what brought you joy as a child? As an introvert, that doesn't involve parties or circles of friends or things like that. For me, it was really about collecting things. And one of my favorite things to collect was seashells. I can't remember how old I was. I was probably about 10 years old. My grandfather built me a display shelf, a five-tiered display shelf, so that I could display my seashells. I love my seashells and finding them and naming them and thinking about where in the world they came from. I can totally relate to this. I feel like there's like a deep inner landscape in that kind of daydreaming too, because it you get to think about all the nuances of, like you just said, where the shell came from. There's something interesting about thinking about the history of things. I know that most of your work is with introverted people. And this month, we've been talking about following passion. I wonder if even just the idea of saying we follow our passion, does saying follow your passion put pressure on introverts to feel like you're going for something big or, you know, whatever version of success we might see in the media or something? Yeah, I don't think it's the following our passion that's the challenge. I think it's talking about it, that pressure to be bold and and really speak about 
things as if they're larger than life, which extroverts do so easily, but introverts tend to keep these things private and quiet. I think when you hit a conversation topic where an introvert is passionate about something, they come to life, they get bubbly. But especially that pressure to talk in a setting or prove yourself in a corporate setting, that can be really challenging. Well, and maybe also before we go any further with this, let's talk about what is an introvert? Because I think, and I know I've had a couple of other past guests on to talk about it. It often gets associated with someone who is shy or timid. And that might be an external representation of who these folks are, but what's actually going on with an introvert? Yeah, they're they're really different things. Being shy or timid is a way you interact with people. What's going on for an introvert who may be gregarious, that introvert is having a different relationship with their energy. And so as an introvert, we need to really manage our energy. And have you heard of the spoon theory? I always forget who came up with that, but you know, we all get so many spoons at the beginning of the day. But for some of us, every interaction takes more and more of those spoons. So it can be a real challenge to get through the end of the day, which is why most introverts, by the time they get home, they just want to crash and ignore the rest of the world. When I used to lead retreats, they'd be a weekend long retreat. And by the end of the day on Saturday, which of course was only about halfway through, I would be so tired that people would be like, oh, do you want to like meet up after dinner? And I'd be like, no, I just want silence, (laughs) which was always a little bit surprising to me because I was doing something that I loved, but it was so draining on me energy wise to both be speaking in front of people and then, I mean, really holding space for people throughout the day. It was the first inkling of maybe I'm not an extrovert. Like, Hmm. But let's throw another term out there too, because ambivert is the person who mm. has traits on both sides. That whole introvert extrovert thing is a scale. It's yeah. if you think of it as a zero to ten scale, the extrovert is the person who's the ten. They get their energy by being in crowds. They think out loud. The introvert is the person who wants that quiet time, needs to have that that peace to come back to center. And their thoughts are really well figured out before they ever give voice to them. So the ambivert is the person that's closer in the middle and can hop back and forth over that. And especially in in a corporate setting, you might strive to do that extroverted thing in the corporate setting, and you might have trained yourself to do that really well, but you still want that time away. Maybe it's just the weekend you need to regroup. Or when you go on on a retreat, you don't want to be the one leading it and responsible. You want to be the one at peace and quiet. Thank you for bringing up the ambivert because I I mean, that actually is what I have been. So I think it is. And I, I know that it's oftentimes that I'm trying to act like an extrovert because that's what's air quotes expected of people. Like that seems what's valued. I just found that it would just deplete my energy even more quickly when I was trying to play an extroverted role. You know, especially in our country, the U.S., The corporate environment was made by extroverts for extroverts. So they're actually thinking you're going to be on, revved up, ready to go, go, go all the time. That's why they schedule these meetings back to back. They don't need time in between to process or regroup or get grounded. That is such a good point. So it's really funny because even today on Instagram, I posted something about somebody saying they were taking the day off because they thought it was more important than working on the Q2 all hands meeting presentation deck. And I, I got to believe that like there's also this expectation that even the, and I'm saying this because even the all hands meeting are often these kind of, <laughs> they're almost like a, a rally, like a Let's all cheer ourselves. And it very much has an extroverted energy that is just too much sometimes. Absolutely. It's very draining. So let's talk about your book because your book very much speaks to how an introvert, really it's stepping up and standing out, but it's also finding an intentional comfort within themselves so they feel comfortable stepping up and standing out. What brought you to write this book? The subtitle I thought about using was without straying too far from your comfort zone, because that's part of the trick, right? You've you've got to practice little steps, little steps, little steps, and then your comfort zone gets a little bit bigger and bigger. And really for me, the, the book came out of the lessons that I learned in my years through corporate, struggling to meet expectations and 
literally burning myself out, burning that candle at both ends, not just yeah. for pressure from the work environment, but also it was my escape from my personal environment, spending all that time and all that energy and, and learning the hard way how to step back and manage it. That, that chapter that about putting your hands in your pants pocket. That was one of those little aha moments that kind of rocked my world. Because until then, every time somebody walked up to me with a question or a problem, I put my hand out to take it. It was wearing me down. I had to learn to find those little moments where I could breathe and I could think about things before I dove in and performed. So the get pants with pockets is number nine. And I felt like when I read about that tip, it really spoke to the boundaries that we, anyone in a workplace, introvert or not, needs to honor. Because I, I think I've certainly been in places and, and it actually brought up a memory for me about when I was a, a brand new employee at a place. And I was pretty fairly senior in my role. It wasn't like I was the new kid. And literally the culture was all about as someone new came in, not with the approval of the manager, but they were just trying to dump stuff <laughs> on the new person. And unless you checked in with your boss and also started saying, well, I don't know if that's really my role. I don't really like to stand up to controversy. So it was super exhausting to have these people come over and be like, here, do this. And I felt like your aha moment was really impressive. Yeah. How do you see it playing out for other people? How can reminding yourself of your boundaries help other people? I mean, reminding ourselves of our boundaries is critical on any day. If we didn't have boundaries, we'd be driving down the highway at breakneck speed. Or somebody would be put, put, putting along while somebody else is breakneck speed. Or we'd leave the doors open to our house and we wouldn't have locks. We think about big boundaries, but we forget the importance of the small boundaries where we're taking care of ourselves. And if we don't have those boundaries, we're just giving and giving and giving our time, our energy, our resources. I think the idea of having pants with pockets, first of all, I said invest in pockets for a reason because it's a change that I had to make. And I think it's a change we each need to make to recognize I can do this for me. And if I do this for me, I'll be better able to perform my job or be there for my family when I do get home in the evening, things like that. Yeah. And if you are in the actual situation for people that are not managing you or handing you work, if, if you're in that literal position or you just find yourself accepting things, I think giving yourself permission to question it, even if it's just stop, send a brief email to your boss. Is this something I should be taking on? Because I think it's easy to get in that space of feeling like, oh, I don't really want to cause any trouble, so I'll just take it. And that's where the burnout, that's the road to burnout for sure. As you can imagine, if somebody's walking up to me and they're used to me reaching out my hand and taking that folder or whatever the problem is, right? And all of a sudden, I put my hands in my pockets and maybe even step back to create a gap between us, they're going to see that as, if not defensive, perhaps offensive. You know, they're going to see that as a counter move. You introduced um, a phrase that you might say to people too, which was, tell me more before you accepted things. Could you tell me more about tell me more? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. That phrase, tell me more, gives me a chance to connect with them and to let them know I'm not ignoring them. I'm not pushing them away but tell me more. So for me, it's that minute to think, what's going on here? What's my part in this? How can I best yeah. help out? And for many of the staff that I was dealing with at the time, at that point, I wasn't necessarily in a leadership role, but staff were coming to me, that entry-level staff or even peers, it gives me a chance to help them learn something more. Now, if it's the oddball problem and we've never seen it before, they're probably not going to figure it out. I don't know how I'm going to figure it out. I'll say, let's work through this together. But giving them a chance to stop and look at this, what do they already know? What could they learn or do next to solve that problem? That's me helping them to further their journey in the organization. And it took me a little while to figure out that that was important for them as well as me. Yeah. And when you step back and you ask someone to tell me more, I'm also seeing that it elevates your role as a leader because you're not jumping into fix-it mode, but you're inviting them to see you as someone 
who can advise instead of someone who can fix, which is a very different role for anyone in leadership. Yeah, and really critical to to get to that dynamic before you move up in an organization. Because the higher you move up in an organization, the more they're expecting you to delegate rather than solve all the problems. And I think that is one of the hardest things, too, about moving into leadership in a corporate setting is many people who are recognized are very good at the day-to-day kind of specialist level job that they love. As a project manager, that is exactly what I loved. When I got then moved into like executive producer or heading towards a director role, it was no longer about doing the work, which I'm now seeing as an introvert, it's a safety zone, like I can just step back and do my work, but it's asking me to step into a position where I have to manage the people. Okay, huge aha moment here, Heather. How do people bridge that gap? I think that's a big problem for introverts or a what? Not a problem. It's a big opportunity for introverts. It is a huge opportunity for introverts, especially if they're really passionate about the work they're doing and they want to advance in the organization. You know, the first thing that comes to my mind when you ask about that transition is you're talking about somebody who's going from attending meetings to leading meetings. And, and maybe even not being the leader of the meeting, but it's their meeting. Somebody else may facilitate the process, but it's that leader's meeting and the outcome of it is important for their work. And the trick that I see as a challenge for introverts is making sure that their voice gets heard amongst all the extroverts who literally think out loud. They are sharing their thoughts as they're popping into their mind. Whereas the introverts are all sitting there trying to take all, all this information in and process it before they actually render a opinion or a decision or recommendation. So in, in your journey, then, as an introverted leader, you've got to become comfortable with managing not just the energy, but the room, the people in the room in a very subtle way. Give them a time to talk it all out. Let them get all those ideas out. And then you kind of swoop in and shape things and mold things. I'm hearing this. I'm thinking that so-and-so said this and -and so-and-so said that. I think if we put those together, we'll get this. And this is where we want to go. There's a little bit in there where when you start to own that as a gift that you, that the introvert or you can bring to the room. And I say that because if you're managing an introvert, you might also want to note this, that people with an introverted way of being, oftentimes they're just synthesizing very quickly. (laughs) in the background. And that's why they're being quiet. They're literally taking it in and making new opinions and they're going to come up with something really, usually amazing by the end of the meeting. Sometimes us introverts don't have the answer by the end of the meeting, but let us go back Mm -hmm. to our desk or let us sleep on it. And we'll come back with that synthesized answer, that synthesized suggestion. That's really powerful. I also found, so We've talked about the boundaries piece of invest in pockets. And then I found, and you even mentioned it in tip 18 about don't give away your power, that it's related to these boundaries or having pants with pockets. How do you see introverts often giving away their power, either in a leadership role or if they're maybe even an entry-level person in a corporation? I'm not sure that this is just introverts. And I don't want to get into a side conversation about people pleasers, but One of the things that we do so easily is we let someone else make the choice. And that's not just Mm -hmm. at work. I mean, that might be with your spouse, your family, community groups that you're involved with. But especially in the workplace, the extroverts in the room are going to make a decision and they're going to go with it and they're going to live with it. And as introverts, it's important for us to recognize what's stirring in us and at least share our thoughts. You know, we might not always get to make the decision. We might not always get to influence the decision, but if we share our thoughts and our logic behind what's going on, I think that makes for a better conversation and it puts us in a better position where we don't feel torn between, you know, what we think is right and what we think is wrong. As I was writing out these questions and thinking about our conversation, I very much was thinking like when you are an introvert and you layer in perfectionism, people pleasing, and maybe if you're a highly sensitive person, so we're going there, <laughs> then it starts to layer in a series of things that you're you're silently navigating through in your mind 
of, you know, you want to make sure everyone's happy. It's very uncomfortable to speak out. It, it has to be perfect before you can voice it. And you don't, and it's very uncomfortable to be put on the spot because of the introvert piece of it. If you have those tendencies, you know, maybe the intentional comfort here is to acknowledge them and acknowledge they're there because you're working through a lot more, even just mentally and energetically in every conversation <laughs> than some people who are just out there extroverts. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it goes back to that, having that, whether it's a moment, an hour, a day, having that pause point where we can breathe into what's going on and process the information or the choices that are at hand. That is so important. Yes. Because even in advertising, when I worked in ad agencies, I mean, there was always that pressure of everything has to be done right now. The client's waiting. And one of my very wise bosses would say, there's no such thing as a web emergency because we mostly worked in web dev at the time. And I think that kind of insight of like, hey, tap the brakes and pause this for a minute I mean, it's good for business because the, usually the knee-jerk reaction from anyone is, is not like the most thought out, but it also is, it serves an introvert really well because then you can slow down, you can get into how you know you process information, whether that's writing or a spreadsheet or whatever the thing is. And it gives you time to come back with a really thoughtful response instead of it just being like, I'm on the spot. When we give away our power, it also leads more quickly to burnout. Do you see that to be true? So the thing about burnout is it's usually happening not just because we're busy, busy, busy. It's happening because we continue to give, to serve, to use up our time and energy to the point of exhaustion. In my case, to the point of a near head-on collision. And so when we are doing that, we're not being true to our own values. We're not being true to ourselves, but we're not being true to those values, which really can help us to set our priorities, to help us decide how to use our time, our energy, our money, our other resources. I think a lot of us, uh, especially if we're in a career, we have a family or we have a mortgage or whatever it is, we feel like we just have to go, go, go to keep those things afloat. And many of us don't stop to question why or why am I doing this? And values are a very powerful way to, to find better alignment. Do you have a favorite way for people to get in touch with their values? I don't think that there's one right way to do it. Essentially, what you're doing is taking a list of words and seeing which of these seems important to you. It's real easy to come down to maybe 10 words, right? But the goal is to go a little bit tighter. Figure out what are the you know, top three to five things that are your top value. And let me give you an example. If you decide family's a value for me, but the decisions that you make are to work late or work weekends or travel all the time. And so you are never with your family. You need to question, is that a value that you're actually living by? And then figure out how to align with that. For many people, knowing the value can help them figure out, is this the way I want to spend my weekend? Is this the way I want to spend my volunteer time? Is this the right job for me? Because sometimes we're not in the right job or the right company even. So getting grounded on those values helps us make the decisions that are right for us and help us not use up those spoons right away. Yeah. And when it's aligned, then it can actually be somewhat energizing. I'm just thinking of, I mean, my top three values that I figured out even recently are integrity, magic, and expertise. And of course, magic, <laughs> jumpstart your joy like that's the expression of that magic. And so even when I'm spending late nights editing or, you know, reading a book so I make sure that I can get in front of a guest and have a great conversation, that is actually energizing to me. And so where it could be exhausting. And I think that's super interesting. I also notice for myself that that magic comes through where it, I want to be doing work that is aligned with giving back to people. And if it's not, and again, we can go back to advertising, then we also ran into integrity issues there for me. And so I could see where when you start to identify that for yourself, you can see where this is draining my energy versus this is giving me energy. You used a really interesting phrase to do things that are giving back to other people. And one of the things that I find, especially as introverts, is that we tend to think this is my purpose. I'm supposed to help these people in this way. And that may be true, 
but we're not necessarily in alignment with our values. And we need to make sure that we do stay in alignment so that we do have the energy to do those things rather than burning us out. Even, even something fun, even a volunteer activity can lead to burnout. So it's important to come mm -hmm. back to those values to be centered and make sure that you're making decisions based on those core values. And they're different for every person. You can't make them based on yeah. your spouse's values or your partner's values or your friend's values. You have to make them based on what's within you. And I would think too, honoring, if something is exhausting, ask why, because it could even be back to my example of leading retreats. I loved it and I was exhausted and it was okay. But then that also meant I didn't want to do more than a couple or three a year. Like it just was, it gets to be too much. Yeah. And, and not to try to problem solve that, but one of the things that I found, I appreciate collaboration. I really enjoy the opportunity of collaboration and collaborating with the right person is important. Not everybody is going to be a perfect fit for a collaborator with me, but I do find collaborating with somebody who is an extrovert and appreciates what I need. We can hold each other up and that load, you know, it's what I'm really good at holding space for people, but to be the host, to be the point of contact for everything, to have to talk to everybody all the time, that's going to drain me. But to have a partner mm -hmm. who can take that part of the load and then I can do some of the heavy lifting that they're not comfortable with. That makes it a good partnership. And I think finding those people like in a corporate setting as the introvert, recognizing who some of those right alignment folks are, the people that are a good match for you. I think finding, searching them out might also be a really good move because then you know, I can go talk to them and I'm not going to feel like they just dumped a bunch of stuff on me. Great introvert tip. When you have to go networking, in a social setting, in a party or a client soiree or something, be the wingman of an extrovert. <laughs> that way they'll take you around, but they're doing that heavy lifting and you can be a little bit less engaged in the hunting out conversation. I love it. One of the things that, of course, we've been talking about this whole season, season seven, is intentional comfort. And I feel like there's a lot of tips that you share in your amazing book about how can introverts set themselves up to find more intentional comfort? I know we've talked about a couple of them, but do you have further thoughts on what does that look like for introverts? <laughs> so the first phrase I was going to say was honor your boundaries. Part of it is knowing what you enjoy doing and making time and space for that. If you enjoy gardening, but you never get to garden, then you're going to feel frustrated because you're doing things that are other than what I would call rejuvenating or refreshing. So, so know the things that you like to do and make space for them. One of my things is, especially when I was doing business travel, have something that you enjoy that you can make as a destination or a side trip in your travel. So for me, that's finding lighthouses or labyrinths, depending on where I'm at or both. I, I love being able to go find a lighthouse and climb a lighthouse. Disappointing if you don't get to climb it. I love to climb it. But, but the other thing is to go do a labyrinth. And you know, as a labyrinth facilitator, you know how calming that can be to have that journey, that metaphoric journey that you go through as you're walking a labyrinth. So whatever it is that, that you find engaging or exciting or interesting in your life, find ways to make sure that you can build that in. We all need that play, yeah. that adventure. And I really like that you're honoring doing that for yourself, especially when you know you're going to be in more of a, a space that is energetically possibly draining to you and honoring that as, as you travel. I also love what you just said, because I'm wondering, in, like last month, we were talking about liminal space. And do you think introverts have a different relationship with liminal space? It's interesting that you phrase the question that way, because I would say it's the extroverts that have the different space. And I, the reason I say that is I think the introverts are more likely to recognize the liminal space. They're more likely mm -hmm. to, if not pause, at least honor it as they go through it. I think for, for us, liminal space is something that's more comfortable, whereas for extroverts, I think it's just something you got to get past. Hurry up and go through that turnstile kind of thing, you know? Yeah. Very interesting. Because as, even when we're talking about the seashells, that's kind of the same thing is, is you're, in, you're seeing the invitation to go internally 
and see the stories and the connections and all that. And that is liminal space as well. I think that really is an, an introvert's quality, which is really lovely. Well, and what do you love most about either lighthouses or labyrinths? As you ask that question, I'm, I'm thinking, what's the thing that they have in common? And what came to my mind was they're both about the journey. They're not about the destination, which goes back to liminal yeah. space. And I, in just about any situation, project, relationship, I'm processing what's the journey. What are we learning now? What are we transitioning from to? I, I'm very focused on appreciating that time in that space. And yeah. it's interesting. I've got, you know, a number of extroverted friends in my life and I think they appreciate the journey, but they're much more focused on the destination. They're much more focused on when are we going to be there? And, oh, we're here now. It's so cool. And I'm yeah. still processing the journey part of it. That's an interesting um, distinction. Yeah. For me, if I'm traveling, I really like to stop at churches. It doesn't matter if it's a denomination I'm a part of or not. I actually just like to visit them because, and I think it's that sense of, it very much is that sense of liminal space. Like I can be quiet here. No one's going to ask me a question. <laughs> if they did, I could just put my head down and be quiet. I think identifying those things, especially if you're traveling for business or whatever, is so key. And it's really okay to go hang out in a church for an hour if you need to. Absolutely. Or, you know, even if it's just 10 minutes, the point I think is that we recognize that's something that matters to us and we get to go do that as opposed to saying, no, no, I don't have any interest. You know, I'm not going to impose upon your time, you know, especially when you're traveling with other people, it's a balancing act, right? It's not all about what they want or what we want. There's a balance in there. Well, and that is hard. If, if the people pleasing, the perfectionism, the highly sensitive piece comes in and you're with other folks, just kind of regulating yourself in those moments and knowing like, no, I got to just need a moment here. I'll be back. <laughs> if we're looking at your book, which I truly enjoyed and really I felt very seen and very understood and like reading it retroactively put a bunch of the awkwardness of corporate life into place. Is there like a really juicy aha moment that came to you either as you were writing it or that you think is there for folks in your book? One of the things that I have found so heartwarming is that the the people that I've shared it with, whether they are introverts or extroverts, they all see something in there and, and they either think, oh, this is so me or, oh, that's what so-and-so is going through. So even yeah. the extroverts that have read it so far and given me feedback just feel it paints a picture of how things might be different for us. And many of them recognize that the tips in there, I don't think they're exclusive of extroverts, especially in a big corporation. If you're working in an organization, it doesn't even have to be a corporation, but if you're working in an organization that's large, it can feel really easy to get lost in that and to find ways that you can have touch points with individuals, to have your own network. I talk about having your own board of directors who are, they could be outside your organization, right? They're people who value you, who appreciate what you're giving into the world and who encourage you to live your best life. They're not necessarily setting an agenda for you. They're just there to help lift you up. We all need more folks like that. Yeah. And I feel that coaching is one of those people that could be on your board of directors, having an executive coach or having someone to help you process things. I think working with someone like yourself, of course, because I know this is one of the things that you do, is a really powerful way to find your way back to center and really be a highly contributing part of an organization because you know yourself well enough. Absolutely. And the folks that I've worked with who are further along in their career, you know, the higher you get up in your organization, the more you keep things to yourself because you feel like, oh, I'm supposed to know what's going on or I'm supposed to have this all figured out for myself. It is so yeah. helpful to have a coach, a mentor, somebody that can be that sounding board that mirror that holds things up and says, that, is that really true? Is that the way that really works? Super powerful within organizations. And also as somebody that's an entrepreneur, also super helpful. And uh, I think that's a great segue. 
I highly recommend your book. I mean, it really, it's, it's a, it's a tiny book, much like the one I released, but it's such a quick, delightful read that I will link up to it in the show notes. And if people wanted to spend time working with you as a coach that fully understands and gets it as an introvert, where can they find you and how can they work with you? Thanks. So my website is discover with Heather and that's discover with Heather.com. Um, I'm on Instagram and Facebook as discover with Heather, but I spend most of my time on LinkedIn. So stop by and let's connect. Sounds delightful. I will link all those in the show notes. And then of course, my last question for everyone is what are three ways that you can think of to jumpstart joy in your life, in the world, or in other people's lives? So the first thing I thought of to answer that is really to be more grounded. I don't think we put enough emphasis on being centered and grounded because you can't be open for joy if you're helter skelter, you know, running, running hither. But when we're not able to be grounded, and this is not just introverts, but for all of us, when we're not able to have some time to come back to our center, we can't really open and appreciate joy when it is available in the world. So another thing that I list in this really important category of how to have joy is to have opportunities for creativity. And so many people say, I'm not creative. And that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about being the artistic person or the master builder. I'm talking about having moments where you just experience the joy of building something. It could be playing with a recipe, right? Rather than following the recipe directly the way it is. Say, I want to know what happens if I change this ingredient. Or maybe it is picking up those crayons that we played with when we were kids and just playing with color. There are so many ways we can be open to creativity. And I think that's a great place to find joy. <laughs> so my third way, and I'm not sure this is a go-to way for most people, but as I age and I've come to appreciate relationships more, what I've recognized is when I can really sit and be present with somebody and hear their stories, to sit with my dad or an aunt who's, you know, somebody who's lived this full, rich life. And to hear the stories they share and the, the energy and the excitement that they have in bringing them back, that just brings joy to me. Yeah. I love that connection. And of course, creativity too, because I think some of us get so caught in being like the perfectionist piece of, you know, I need to know this before I can start to be creative. And yeah, just going with it, whatever you're drawn to. Yeah. Don't have the expectations of the outcome. Enjoy the journey of the play. Thank you so much for joining me, Heather. This has been such a fun conversation and congratulations on your book. Thanks, Paula. Thank you so much for joining us, Heather. It's been such a treat to have you on. And I really appreciate this thoughtful book that you've written about how introverts can step into their role as leaders in business and elsewhere. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. If you want to purchase this book, you can go to my website, jumpstartyourjoy.com, or go into your show notes in your podcasting app. And within the show notes, you will see links to Heather's site, to Heather's book, and how you can interact with her. I encourage you to tell her that you found her here on Jumpstart Your Joy, and I hope that you'll purchase her book. I really found it to be quite enjoyable and very insightful. So if you want to listen to other episodes like this, again, there's another introverted <laughs> discussion with Laura Lee, and that is, uh, that'll is that be linked as well. You can find that on jumpstartyourjoy.com. And you can also, of course, sign up for the newsletter there on Jumpstart Your Joy, and you'll get notifications each time I release a new episode. Next week on the show, I'm super excited to have rock star Fred LeBlanc back. He is the drummer, lead singer, and founder of the band Cowboy Mouth, and he's been on the show a couple times before. A story about him is actually featured in my book, and so it's a real treat to be reunited with him. Again, for the first time since the pandemic. Uh, we talked early pandemic, and now he's talking about his new song, Mardi Gras, State of Mind. I can't wait to share that with you. I hope you'll come on back for that fun discussion with Fred. And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much.